As we started recording this episode, we had technical difficulty that interrupted our first participant's introduction, Dr. Quimina Mensa. Lieutenant for Ben ISD. Raquel Wesson, Assistant Principal in Rosa Parks Millbrook Elementary, Lancaster ISD. And I am Amanda Jones, a first grade ELA and math teacher for KIPP um, New Orleans. All right, and I'm so excited to have my special guest with me today. We, what are some topics that, what's some things going on, some topics that you've experienced in schools, man? What's going on with y'all? Get it off your chest. Well, we just talked about behavior, and <laughs> that's <laughs> something that's always at the forefront of my mind, for yes, sure. Yes. Um, I mean, I know, especially since we have so many different things that we have to do, as, you know, as teachers and different tricks we have to pull out of our hat, but you know, we still have kids that are not responding to those behaviors. And then we also are not allowed to suspend kids as much or do, you know, other things. And it's kind of like tying our hands sometimes. And that's a little frustrating. Okay, so let's talk about this issue. I, I was made aware recently that there's been some changes and students can no longer be suspended from school if they are, what, what, what's the grade levels? Anywhere between whatever, pre-K through second grade. Hmm. Well, I know how you feel as a teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You got to respond to all these different behaviors while teaching the curriculum mm -hmm. in a certain amount of time. So you have accountability for how you're going to teach these kids and also manage their behavior socially. Yeah. But at the same time, looking at those kids as they're growing and trying to learn how to interact with others, we have to teach them lessons in the classroom. And also parents got to, mm -hmm. so I, I yeah. guess the challenge is if they're not in school, they're not learning those lessons. True. So ultimately you're trying to create a system where you keep kids in school because if they're out of school, they fall in further behind. See, but it's kind of like a double-edged sword mm -hmm. to me. It's kind of like, okay, on one hand, we know that our, especially African-American students are being disproportionately suspended given all these exclusionary kind of discipline placements and we know that that's bad yep and we know that it happens like a <coughs> lot with our especially with our boys so on one hand you want to say you can't suspend them and then expect that they're going to be able to achieve at the same level as everybody else because they weren't getting the instruction mm -hmm. but on the flip side you have a teacher let's say like i had i might have had like 34 kids in my class at some point when i was a teacher like i mean had like <coughs> over 30 kids um, but that was at a high school level. So let's, let's say an elementary teacher has like 20, uh, 20 other kids in the classroom and little Jimmy is like constantly being a problem. Like, what are you, I mean, you don't want him to be suspended, but like, what's that time? It's See, a major that, issue. Yeah, that's my issue too. Because I'm in the classroom and I've been teaching in elementary. Like I taught third grade, I taught first grade and things like that. And it's, it comes a point when I have to worry about the other kids and make sure that they are being taken care of and they are safe. And if you're being unsafe and you're consistently being unsafe, is like that's where the issue comes in hand, right? Like a prime example, I have one kid is, you know, cut, trying to cut a kid's shirt or cut, trying to, you know, be cut, constantly mm -hmm. threatening to no. that kid or things like that. And there's nothing, no real consequences being had. So then that kid thinks, okay, well, I can get away with continuing to do those things. I think the mindset is not that you won't be able to <laughs> suspend any of them. It's just that we're trying to look at reducing it so that, because there are times where there are some behaviors that people are suspending kids for mm -hmm. that aren't even warranted. True. Mm -hmm. And when you got a kid that's in first grade that's you know, getting suspended because they were talking back to a teacher, and now they're going to miss school. I don't think that that's a reason to suspend a kid. And you're seeing cases across like the state of Texas where you got kids who are in kindergarten and first grade who are being disrespectful and they're getting sent home and they got to mm -hmm. stay at home for that. Right. You know, I, I understand when it becomes egregious when you're like assaulting someone, then we got to do something about that. But I think there's some behaviors that we're suspending kids for that are teachable moments. And I think for me, I think it's frustrating because we don't suspend students when we could for those type of instances it would be repeated misbehavior mm -hmm. repeated disrespect spitting hitting you know those type of things now to my understanding we can't suspend them at all and i heard you say there are some instances that you can so to my understanding that we can't do it at all and i think for us on our campus it's frustrating because once we get to that point 
you need to be because we've given you multiple chances. We've mm -hmm. given you a chance to refocus. We've given you a chance to talk to your parent. We've given mm -hmm. you a chance to go to another classroom, come back, and you keep doing the same thing. And I know I came from secondary. So I know my principal, I was like, okay, you're not in secondary no more. So I've learned how to talk and okay let's try it again so, so when it gets to the point where you're just persistent with your misbehavior yeah then i think and, and we used to do it before before the rule came out we used to just say hey come pick them up early yeah it doesn't even go into as a suspension mm -hmm. come pick them up early as long as you pick them up by three bring them back tomorrow we'll try it again so we can't even do that anymore so it does get, and then iss is you're not supposed to have iss anymore so, I think I think there's a, there's a problem that we have a disconnect between what's happening in school and what's happening at home. Yep, right. Because a lot of times these issues that we're having at school, you know, if we have some support for some outside entities, like if some parents were involved, and there's some amazing parents out there who mm -hmm. step in. Yeah, we like to they call make, the parents. They, they make get a difference. Mad. Ooh, yeah. they be like, you know, "Girl, that's the best shaking. call." When they're like, "Wait till I get up there," yeah. Yeah. that I'm makes like, me yes. happy. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we need to have some better partnerships with some of our parents to help support them. So because sometimes we have parents that just don't even know how to deal with those behaviors at home. No, really. I've had parents ask me one time. I don't even have kids. Like, I had a parent one time just like, I just don't know what, what else to do. do. Like, what, what would they you suggest? All the, I time. Do. Mm -hmm. all the time. I just don't know. And it's just so funny because even now, like it started teaching, we put so much emphasis on like character building and things like that. When I was in school, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, however. 10 years know, ago. Well, you know, <laughs> when I was in elementary, okay, we'll say that. But, you know, it was no, it was no character building at all. So it's, I feel like there, a lot of people are putting a lot on the schools and the teachers and things like that. And they're not taking accountability for the things that they should be teaching at home. Like a lot of, like you just said, it's just, it can't all be the teacher. It can't. All, we have to legit be a partnership. And right. it's contradictory because the the profession is not respected as it was before. Not at all. I remember. I mean, my mom used to talk about how if you were a teacher, you were respected almost as much as a doctor mm -hmm. years ago. So it's like you put weight on us. You want us to do all this, but at the same time, you don't respect my profession. You don't respect me when I call you. If I call you and say, hey, can you just talk to me? What did you do? What did you say? It's like, wait, 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 wait what? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm the adult here. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just, that is a direct correlation, but it's, it's very frustrating. I always tell parents, trust me, I got a kid of my own. I'm managing teachers. Nobody has time to pick on your child. If I'm calling you, mm -hmm. it's a serious problem. I'm not saying we always right. I'm not saying teachers don't so, get out of hand sometimes. sometimes. Make mistakes too, but but yeah, if I'm calling saying. you about your parent, Please, your child, please don't make it seem like I was spending time out of my day or my teachers are spending time out of day to pick on your child. But so let you me. Said, she oh, said something ahead. that I want mm -hmm. to point out. You said something about the profession not yes, being respected. Yes, that's what I want to talk about. So, you know, I, I agree with you. There are a lot of people who don't respect the profession the way it used to. Right. But I think educators have the responsibility of bringing the respect back to the Amen, Jesus. And the number one way to do it is how you dress. Because sometimes that, they're, okay, not, this might get it off my chest, they're so not standing up. <laughs> You know, <laughs> because it, it, when you have people that, you know, decide that they want to become teachers mm -hmm. and they want to become teachers because they have the summers off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if that's the main reason why you're in a profession, then of course people are going to think that you took this job because you could have a break. Yeah. And right. not because you're invested in the Oh my the Lord. Children. So okay. I get frustrated when I hear people say, oh, I got this job. I, I love it because I have the summers off. Yeah. No. yeah. Oh Lord. And That's really true. and truly, if you're a lifelong learner, I haven't had a summer off yet. Oh no. Because I'm going to conferences, or I'm going. And not to mention, you scheduling all your doctor's appointments in the summer. You're planning. Yeah. Like, because you don't want to be teacher to take off. So really, I never really have a break. Right. So now my time. Let's pivot to uh, my get it off my chest uh, issue has to do with something that you touched on, the professionalism. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I I feel like. Like you said, Dr. Mensa, in order for us to get back to professionalism and being viewed and respected and revered in the way the teachers used to be in our community, I feel like uh, the, the weight of that harm is kind of on us because a lot, a lot of times there are things that we can do. You will hear teachers talk down about being teachers yeah. sometimes. And to me, it's like you don't hear doctors just walking around like, oh, you know, well, I'm just a doctor. I'm just going to be a doctor for now just. until I mm -hmm. it's just like just like this is a kid. And I remember once I'm having a debate with someone where she was really like, well, you know, uh, 
as a doctor, you have somebody's life in your hands. So it's kind of, so and I was good. like, you think if a child spent a year in a classroom where they're not getting what they need, that's not having a child's life in your hands, then you don't understand the power of education. Like, especially for students who are not getting those things at home that are going to help prepare them for the next level. Yeah. Like, it's life or death in that classroom. Very much so. And so I feel like, like you were saying, the professionalism, even in how we dress. Yes, that's um, my biggest pet peeve. Even how, when I went to elementary, <laughs> that was the first time I saw, like, it was real, real different. Yeah. Like, at the high school, we had to have, like, the guys had to have a tie on. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to have certain things. And even when people got lax, I was just like... Why are you talking about elementary like that? Because at elementary, elementary y'all get all... I mean, like, we, some, we, I'm sure you have some. Look, well, I'll say this. I, look, I don't always dress as professional, but I'm also running behind kiddos, like, all day and okay. wrangling with kiddos. It, like, I'm not going to be okay with tearing up my $100 jeans or my 100 I mean, I'm professional, but, uh -huh. you know, I, I keep it, you know, kind of comfortable too a little bit because i'm it's, it's a lot always going on. dressed up it's a lot going on it's a, it's a different environment it is and and, and that's different from high school you know what i mean we like 10 minutes that's yeah, it's, it's, it's a different environment oh. because like you said if, if you're on the floor with some kids <laughs> yeah. and y'all doing a project yeah and you i got, teach from the carpet like, I teach from... A little bit but i, I mean it's, I, it's I see that but at the same time i was taught it i taught middle school i taught seventh grade math and i dressed up every day and I was on the floor with 12 year olds. I was on the floor with 13 year olds. And I, I, but I think we're talking about like, just sometimes you just, oh, you really have on like yesterday in tights with like a shirt that stops right here. Or just your oh, whole yeah. disposition in general. Yeah, Not yeah, just yeah. like what you're wearing, but how you're wearing it, how yes. you talk about yourself, how you carry yourself, how you feel like. Cause you can tell a blazer on and dress up something in a minute. Yeah, That's but true. you hear people say stuff like, oh, well I'm gonna <laughs> teach for a couple years and then I'm going to. But that's because know. they don't have the correct mindset too. You know what I mean? Like right. I've always wanted to teach. My mom was a teacher, things like that. But do I think that I'm gonna be teaching until I'm like 60? No. But you know what I mean? This is still my passion. This is right. still something that I wanted to do. I went to college for it. I have a degree in right. it. You know, I went to education, you know, college education for it. But I also do have other passions too that okay. is just not all, you right. know, going to be about teaching. And I think that's important. Years. That's important too. That's just one thing I had to get off my chest. It is nothing worse. You then know, hearing just somebody just like, oh yeah, well I I, I might be a teacher for a couple of years and I'm gonna like that's why they don't take us as a quick in and quick out profession. Like yeah. it's yeah, fast to get in. Do you see problem. billboards in Texas that say want to be a teacher? Yeah. Call Texas teachers today. Like we'll yeah, have you teaching true. in no time. Like that's true. if they did that to be a doctor, like you'd be like, I ain't going to that doctor. Like you want to be a doctor you in see, six weeks? It you, can't what? be. It can't be a fallback. Profession. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. if, if it's like your fallback because you didn't have something couldn't else do to this yeah. and you didn't cut and like you know what I'm gonna do this, then you're gonna treat it like that. Yeah. It can't be your yeah. backup. I had this somebody in an interview really kinda infer like that. Like, well, you know, I was doing da 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 da. And so now I'm, you know, I figured I so I was just out. like <laughs> yeah. get it's not a game. It's not because it's you difficult. Play. People, and the, the thing is, people walk into you know, school is try to start teaching. Like I thought it was, hey, this is going to be easy. It's not, it's, it it's is hard. hard work. Yeah, It's yeah. beyond it's hard work. This it's is some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life. Yes. It's rewarding, but it's Very hard work. So. Okay. So we touched two. Anybody else have a different thing they need to get off their chest before I address some of the questions that are, that have come in. Mm -hmm. Behavior and the suspensions. Okay. So let's go to here. We have um, one question. Just curious. How does that conversation with the parents look? Do you find the parents siding with the child or with you as an educator? Uh, I will. As an assistant principal, I handle most of the discipline. So it could start, it could, it could start out from the hello, like the phone can ring and, and they answer the phone. What he do now? <laughs> and it's like, hey, this oh, is this no. I'm assistant principal for Rose Park. And sometimes it could, it don't even have to be a bad call. It could be. I, I encourage teachers to call parents that students are doing good. Mm -hmm. I'll call parents if I haven't seen somebody in the office. I've seen them back to back, to back to back. It's like, come on, tell your mom I haven't seen you this week. So I think it starts out from there, like a defense mechanism, because I'm a parent. I know my child. Yeah. So if you call me and Kaden was doing this, I'm not gonna say that wasn't him, because I know what he does and I think that's where it starts off sometimes where it's the defense mechanism of my baby because mm -hmm. I adore my baby but yeah we, I think overall we don't do a good enough job of 
establishing relationships with parents. Mm -hmm. right. so, That's where it starts. Like when you see That's the phone saying. number, like if you see a one eight hundred number calling you, mm -hmm. you already know that this is about nothing. Yeah. Right. A bill. So but it's going to be some, some. Most times it's going to be a bill. It's like you got to pay something, so you already have a feeling. So once you hear it, you're like, okay, I'm not trying to hear that. If every time someone from the school calls, it's because the kid was absent mm -hmm. or they got in trouble, then as soon as you call, they're going to feel like that. But I'm at a campus that we don't call only for that, and you still get the same thing. So I guess it's just like a catch-22 situation. With some people. Yeah. yeah. But, but you're, you're at a campus that, that does that, right? Mm -hmm. but, and we but, still, but, but I like still this, get it. You're one campus. Right. So they have experiences with schools. Yeah. So if more schools do what you're talking about, then their experience is not going to be like that. Mm -hmm. Because there might be one 800 number calling people saying, hey, we're going to give you something, and you're actually going to get it. But you got to go through like 99 of those before you find that one. Well, I'm sort of people that's been in this pipeline. Your kid been to school since kindergarten. Yeah. And they in the fourth grade. But now. sometimes those are the you parents the too. Culture. They just get mentally yeah, fatigued because they saying. can't stay in trouble. They just get mentally. Yeah. They're like, what is it? Like, I'm trying to work and you calling my phone. And that they always say that I'm at work. Like, me too. Yeah. But what do y'all think about home visits? Because I've heard of a lot of schools doing we do. home visits where they visit the home of every kid before the school yep. year starts. To build an authentic relationship yep. to know more about that kid i can talk uh to that because we do home visits before um school even starts we all go out as a team we all have like three or four kids like one kid is probably one in your class some kids are aren't in your class they go and we go through like a uh, agreement the kid has to sign the parents have to sign we have to sign as a you know educators that say that we're going to do these certain things for your kid this year the kid knows exactly what we expect of them the parent knows what we expect of them. Now, we do this, but then, you know, it's still... How does it translate into what you get in the classroom? Mm, or the, some kids, do you get, you feel like you get more parental, like, support and involvement because y'all are going to do home visits? I, and... I feel like it helps, but then I also feel like, you know, people just have, have their own thoughts about things, you know what I mean? And they're not going right. to necessarily, you know, really care about it. You know, they're just going through the motions just because this is something that we have okay. to do for our school, right. right? And some people actually take heed to it. Like, okay, I appreciate that you're coming to visit us. I appreciate that you're actually putting forth the effort to, you know, get to know me and my family inside our home. This is something that's sacred. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just <laughs> depends. Yeah. I mean, it, it's helpful for me. Yeah, I was just asking, what are your thoughts about the home visits? Because when I, you know, I go to Ron Clark Academy um, for trainings as I can because I just love the school and the environment. That's one thing that they always talk about is how they go to every kid's home and they want to see, you know, like what their in home is like, where's your room, what is it, and kind of see them in their element and show them kind of that they are interested in that as well as the academic side. So yeah. I know it's just a lot um, actually in my apartments, there was, uh, some people from the local high school were like running around trying to figure out, I was like, what are y'all doing? And they were like, can you let us up? We're here for home visits. So I guess in Dallas ISD, they may be doing that too. I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, let's try to build the team and family. You I'm know? trying to think that we answered his question. So oh, his question, yeah. I think that they more, do they side with the child or do they side, they side with, with you the child. as an educator? Mm -hmm. See, my mama didn't ask no questions. It was yeah. just very simple. If the teacher called then you did whatever they said, and now yeah. here's your consequence. It's not even a conversation. More times than not, I've, I've experienced siding with the child, but you, get, you probably have more experience. I think it depends on the parent and mm -hmm. depends on the teacher. Yeah. Because sometimes teachers have reputations where parents will believe the teacher because they have a good reputation, mm -hmm. because they have good relationships with kids. So they don't think that that teacher would do something. Mm -hmm. But some teachers are standoffish, and, and then the parent is going to think already – like, okay, if something happens, then this teacher is wrong. They come to open house and they won and they want to get their kid out of the classroom because of their first interaction with the teacher. Yeah. So it's the relationship that they have with the teacher that makes a difference. That's that makes sense. Think. All right. Well, um, I like to ask the fresh classroom stands for fun, relevant, engaging standards based in higher order. Let me open up my fist. <laughs> Fun, relevant, engaging standards based in higher order. So when you think about your time on campuses and in classrooms, which one of those things, the last question, which one of those things just kind of emerges as something that you really feel is the most valuable? If you had to choose one, when you're looking at, man, this is an awesome classroom, or man, I just did a dope lesson today or whatever, which one of those things kind of stands out to you? Fun, relevant, engaging, standards based, or higher order? 
Man, you know what? It's like you asking me to pick. They were like, not prepared for this which question. Which one of my brothers <laughs> do I like the most? Exactly. It's exactly what I'm asking you to do. Because he's like, all those things need to be in there. Exactly. It's an awesome class. So. <clears throat> I think what catches my eye, though, mm -hmm. is fun. That's yeah, what I was going to say. That's too. what catches my eye off the top. Yeah. Because if the kids are having fun, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they want to return back to this place to do more of that. Right. And right. if they enjoy that experience, then it's a place that they can actually retain information and learn and then be successful. If mm -hmm. they're not having fun, then they're disengaged. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I just don't know how you can get to a level of engagement if they're not enjoying the experience. I always ask teachers, but don't you want to have fun too? Exactly. Like when I do this training, I'm always like, yeah, we want the kids to have fun, but think about it. You have to come here every day. Exactly. Like if you have to come here every day, mm -hmm. like wouldn't you want, when you do a fun lesson as a teacher, you just, you get you get to having fun with the kids too. Exactly. Like, don't you want to? Have fun? I like to play games with them too. Yeah, it, it's just fun for everybody. I choose fun. Fun. Yeah, I would agree too. You know, fun. You have to have fun for them to be engaged, and you know, things like that. And you and they have to believe that you love it. Yeah. I remember when I taught math, they used to be like, you really like this stuff, huh? And I'm like, yep, I sure do. And you're going to, like, you, why would I enjoy it if you're standing up there and you're teaching English or whatever you're teaching and you act like it's not something that you want to do? Right. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, math is a subject that nobody liked. The students didn't like it. The mm -hmm. parents didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So it was my right. job to make it fun. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would go with fun. Yeah. But I think your passion kind of, I, re I remember, you know, just, we were teaching kind of around the same time. Just your passion for it can transform the minds of the students about how they feel about it. Just seeing you, first of all, you're African American and a woman or what they may have never seen anyone that looks like you, that looks like them, yeah. that cares about this particular thing, you know? So for me, that was reading and writing. So for English, like as an English teacher, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, we're about to start the next unit today and it's going to be super awesome. It's going to be the best unit that we do all year. It's my favorite unit. It is the poetry unit. Oh my God. Let me tell you, we are going to write such awesome poems. I'm going to share y'all some of my favorite poems and I'm going to write <laughs> poems with you. And it would be everything. And then when that unit was up, I'd be like, we are going to do expository writing. And let me tell you what that is. Your <laughs> favorite thing. It's my favorite Everything unit. your favorite thing. Yeah. Every time it was like, because this is what you use it for. And this is why it's important that you know how to write this genre good. And when you go to college, you'll have to know how to do this and this. And it's just like, we hate writing. But if you're super pumped about yeah. it, then it's like, they got to kind of just get on board, you know? That's so that's what fresh teachers do. Um, I would no, like real, to. Oh, I'm just saying, ahead. when you think about your life, when you think about experiences, mm -hmm. like you, the ones that you remember, Mm -hmm. are the ones that you enjoyed the most yeah. and the ones that were the most painful. Mm -hmm. like those are the ones that you remember. Mm -hmm. like you don't just mm -hmm. remember just a bunch of random stuff because they're not that important to you. Right. So if we can have a lot of fun moments in school, mm -hmm. that's, gonna, that's what's going to keep kids in school. Yep. You know, Because you got to balance it with those painful moments because they're going to have painful moments yeah. throughout the course of their life, right. at sure. home, in school, different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to bring that fun to the school. Awesome. Less words? Did we answer all your questions? We did. Well, there was one more question, but I felt like it was going to make it a whole nother thing um, that we don't have time to answer today. But Miss Tiffany Alexander, I thank you for tuning in, and I'm going to take your question, what was the question? and I'm answer. Sorry, I Come on, y'all want y'all y'all the ones trying to I go to dinner? Know what the We're at a was. conference. We're at the NABZ conference, the National Alliance of Black School Educators, and they're trying to go off to eat dinner. So since they want the question, I'm going to give it to them. Okay, the last question is, how do we work? So y'all were talking about stakeholders and stuff. She said, how do we work to rebuild the partnership with stakeholders? Mm. See, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> rebuild relationship. I, my, okay, let me give you mine. When we talk about engaging, uh, one part of that that I talk about in the training is engaging um, our students with the community. And so I think one way to do it is to include stakeholders. So if you're doing something in the classroom, I would bring in parents that have something to do with that profession that might tie into your unit. Um, any way you can involve people in the community, the police, I've had the police um, come to the school and do a, we were doing a unit about police brutality in communities of color. And at the end of that unit, when they had got done writing about it and researching, we let the cops come up there. We had a thing where they worked with them. Just any ways that you can involve people organically, to me, is how you um, improve those relationships and partnerships with stakeholders. Make it authentic. Let them become a part of the learning. Not just we go out and do something random but in, in the classroom is separate but showing them how these things that we're learning is really are really applicable to real life outside these four walls i think it add to that i would say 
we have to be real clear with our stakeholders about their role and how they can help so they know exactly what they could do. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they're not clear about how they can support, so they're disengaged. And some people can help in different ways. Mm -hmm. So the help needs to be clear and how they can help. And we gotta open up the doors to allow them to come in. Mm -hmm. And we also gotta be quicker to say that we're sorry when we make mistakes yes, and errors. That's because true. too many times we're being defensive and we're trying to be perfect and then that's going to turn people off. They don't want to come to a school where everyone is already right. Mm -hmm. yep. There's already this veil of everyone in the school is perfect. Mm -hmm. So we got to get rid of that and be more vulnerable to allow people to understand that we're just humans too, working with your child. Awesome. Just that, I just add one word, just be patient. Mm -hmm. and be patient. Especially if you're in a community that you know is different and you don't have any support from stakeholders and you're trying to rebuild it, I think it just takes a lot of patience. That makes sense. Yeah. Anything on that one? No, I, I agree with that. Man, it's like y'all covered it all. Yeah. All right. So, to Michael says, uh, when we make school relevant for kids, they will engage and have fun. We should go the extra mile and find ways to incorporate relevance. And what we are teaching, yes, we should. Yep, and the number one way to do that is stop being afraid to bring in your own material. Get oh, out that textbook, Lord, that textbook, buy your own stuff, buy my some candy. Lord. Yes. Go on the internet, yes. research, find something. The textbook, I tell people the textbook was not written from anybody that was at your school with your students. They don't know your kids. They right. never met your kids. Get they out probably that textbook. somewhere in the state, somewhere. Or maybe not even in the state. They writing for this. Anyway, that's a whole nother. Yes. That's a whole nother. I'll well, be we'll chatting for another day. So but yes, what she said, keep like you're gonna make it relevant, look up stuff, keep it freaking freaking freak, fresh in the classroom for the kids. And until next time, head on over to my website at thefreshclassroom.com for bookings. If you need trainings, if you need any consulting work done, that's what I do at the fresh classroom. I want to thank my special guests for staying with me today when they could have been eating gumbo in New Orleans. Could be sleep asleep. <laughs> yes. Uh, sure. We're live from New Orleans. It's been an awesome chat. Um, thank y'all for tuning in to Fresh Chats with Steph, episode three, and we will see you next time. Peace. Bye. Fresh Chats with Steph is brought to you by thefreshclassroom.com. Are you ready to get fresh? If so, head on over.